bless you. Thank you. and I forget that I'm filling in today. How about that? Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. And um, just ask that we all be in prayer for, for Pastor and his family. And uh, just keep him in mind and, and just know that he truly does love us as a congregation. I mean, he was texting me this morning. <laughs> I'm like, you know, don't worry about us. You know, we're... But so that's kind of the kind of man we have and, and his family and his wife and kids. They, they truly love us as a church. And just keep that in mind, so we should be definitely bathing them in prayer as well. But we are uh, very grateful to be together in the house of the Lord today. And uh, just a couple of quick announcements here, if you have a bulletin, if you want to go ahead and grab one. But um, there is men's basketball for 21 and up. I think Roy's out there. So if you're over 21, feel free to to show up and play. And it's on Saturday, November 6th from 9 a.m. to noon. And... um, just a couple of things here too where there's daylight savings time on Sunday, November 7th. So this Saturday, you know, turn it back. It's back, right? Okay, fall back, spring forward. Okay, so fall back. Yeah, you don't want to be here an hour early. So go ahead and, and turn your clocks back this weekend. And just thank you for everybody that was a part of the trunk or treat uh, last weekend. We really appreciate people that showed up, handed out candy, donated money. Uh, baked goods. Uh, it, was, it was a really good time for the kids, and we're just really grateful for everybody that showed up and, and that we're a part of that. And then um, also, if there's anything, I mean, there's some other things in here. There's a thank you from Tony and Susan Jarvis, um, and then also talking about Samaritan's Purse. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but just if you want to, go ahead and grab one of these bulletins and read into it. Is there anything that I'm missing that needs announced? Oh, yes. Joan is, is we're reminding me that we're going to do a turkey draw this year again for Sunday school attendance. So the children and the, then the kids' classes that show up, you know, we'll, we'll look at attendance and see who's been there. And there's a drawing out, and we'll pull the name out of the hat, and we're going to get two turkeys again this year. So i got to remember to buy those. <laughs> so, yeah, keep your mind, yeah, thank you. Anything else that I'm missing? Prayer meeting Wednesday night, what time? 7 o'clock. All right, let's go, and, uh, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, and we just ask that you uh, give a special blessing to Pastor and his family uh, with his, everything going on, and just ask that you keep him safe with his travels, 
and help him to return to us, you know, safely and have a refreshing time with his family and just guide everything and just be with us as a church. Give us your direction and your guidance on what you would like us to do. And we're thankful for you and we praise you for what's going to happen. And in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?
sweet Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet Plunge in today and be made complete Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to You may be seated. Reminder, children now are dismissed for Children's Church. So follow Miss Paula back there. Well, she, there she is. No, you cannot speak in the mic. Keep going. Why? <laughs> you open your Bibles with me, please, to Luke chapter 3. Oh, you know what? Let's do offering first. I forgot about that. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you, Lord. We would just pray that for this offering that uh, would be used for your service, Lord. And we just pray for those that uh, are able to give. And Lord, we just uh, ask that you bless this and, and anoint uh, those in our congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Gene. See what happens? The pastor leaves and we get all thrown off course here. <laughs> so open your Bibles with me again to Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. Wow, praise the Lord. Okay, let's uh, pray. Dear Lord Jesus, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we um, do want to lift up um, Pastor Eric and his brother, Lord, as they're um, out at, uh, with his parents uh, ministering to them, Lord. So we would just pray that you would just uh, anoint their lips, give them the right words to say, and... and uh, comfort and healing, Lord, um, to just uh, be with him and his family as they um, are, are there together. And Lord, we would uh, ask that uh, we want to lift our church before you right now, Lord. We want to, uh, we ask that the Holy Spirit would be here with us this morning, that would uh, speak through John's lips and uh, to open our hearts for the message that he has for us. And Lord, we just prayed you for this opportunity to be in your house, and we just ask now that your Holy Spirit would just uh, uh, fill us and speak to our hearts. We thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning again, everyone. Just a quick side note. I, I, this morning, I even forgot it was Halloween today. And, you know, we, we do things like, you know, we have trick or treat and trunk or treat, you know, it, have fun with costumes. We need to understand, though, that today is a particular day where, you know, we serve the God of everything. You know, he's in control of everything. But also we're told in Scripture that, you know, there's, there's an unseen thing going on that our brains can't perceive. It's the spiritual world. And today, just, and I would ask that today, but when we start off in prayer, today is a day where a lot of people that worship a defeated enemy celebrate. I think you know what I'm talking about. So today is a day where there's going to be a lot of people appealing to one side. Well, we're on the side that wins. And let's pray today that no harm is done, nobody's hurt, and that somehow people that celebrate Halloween for the wrong reasons or for what it was initially intended for, let's pray that the Holy Spirit breaks through. And I've seen so many testimonies of people that were turned one way during Halloween, and now they're Christians, they're saved. And believe me, from the people that have been through the darkest things that this holiday represents, and come out on the other side in the path of light, they are not afraid. Because remember, like I said in the beginning, we, there's a defeated enemy. And we serve the creator of all the universe that has control over everything, and we win, brothers and sisters. So I want to take kind of a quick minute today just to pray for people out there that are, that are lost, that are just following the enemy. Uh, our Father in heaven, thank you so much. And today, you know, we don't give credit to uh, you know, someone who's defeated, that you've already you know, crushed his head. And we know, Lord, that you are in control, you are sovereign. But there are people, Lord, that we're praying for that are deceived. They believe that Satan is someone to be followed and celebrated. And Lord, that uh, we know that you are the true, you're the savior, that you're the conqueror, and you're the king now, and you'll be the king forever. And Lord, we're asking not for these people to be hurt, but for your Holy Spirit to break through and get through to them and, and pull them out of this darkness that they're in. And Lord, help us as Christians to bathe our own, ourselves and our families in prayer during this time, and especially be with um, what Denny was praying about for Pastor Eric and, and his brother and his parents, and be with his sisters too. And anybody involved, help them to see just the miraculous, Father, because we know that you can do that. And the most miraculous thing you can do is change somebody's heart and bring them to you and, and, and pull them out of the darkness, Lord. So for those that are celebrating darkness today, Lord, interrupt their plans. Just bathe them in the, in the light that you have, the light of the Holy Spirit and your Son and, and the Father. Just the, the triune God, Lord. Just show them who's in control and that they're wasting their time following an idol and that they need to serve the, the living and true God. And Lord, just thank you so much for everything and just ask that you be over everybody in this service speak to their hearts through the Holy Spirit, not of my words or any limited knowledge that I have, but speak to them in, in a way that you know that they need, and just help us to advance the kingdom above all else. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Didn't know where I was going with that, but I just felt compelled to pray that, you know, today's Halloween, and, you know, it, it's celebrating somebody that does not need to be celebrated. We're going to talk about who does deserve to be celebrated, and the reason that we're here you know, God, he created everything, he created us, and we're going to get into a few things. Now, people, you know, if, if they have like parties, anybody like to plan things? Anybody? Enjoy it? Yeah, that's not me at all, in any way, shape, or form. Um, if, it, if I wasn't married to the amazing woman I was married to, stuff just wouldn't get done. So God put us together for a reason. Um, I was famously told when I started dating Paula, and when we first got married, uh, by someone who will remain nameless, but he's a, uh, a treasurer here. Uh, he told me, he said, John, if you had to climb Mount Everest, you would die because I don't prepare very well. And he was, it was tongue in cheek, but he was right. You know, I, I'm someone that tends to react to things in life instead of be proactive. Anybody else like that, or is it just me? Like if there's not a hard deadline approaching, stuff just doesn't happen. I don't like that about myself. I wish I was different, okay? Because procrastinators, all, all of us out there, you know that we're just making life harder than it has to be. And it's, it's like the, the plaque I saw one time, it said that organized people are just too lazy to look for things, right? <laughs> so all you procrastinators and people that just toss stuff somewhere, that's right, we're just not lazy, right? Okay. So I, you know, when I was getting ready to do this lesson, I, I keep praying because again, I, I'm a person, uh, God is God, I'm not. And I don't always know what to do and what to speak about. And um, I have in my basement, it's kind of my little 
it, it's kind of my area. I have my desk that my grandpa Phil had that when he passed away, I, I got his desk. And I remember him sitting at that. He had a business of his own. He sold chemicals. I remember that desk, and that's something that I wanted. So I'm down in the basement in my little thing. I got the light that Grandpa had, and I've got my Bible there, and I'm just praying. I'm like, what do I talk about? You know, what do I, because as long as I stick to the Bible, it's going to be okay, because it's God's Word. So this is not the knowledge of John here. And I was reading, and I was reading about John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ. And we're coming into the holiday season where you got to prepare if you're hosting Thanksgiving, um, if there's a Christmas party, if there's, like, for work, if you're in corporate America, a lot of things have to be done by the end of the year. There's deadlines approaching. And someone like myself, like, again, I like to make things really hard. So I've got a lot of work to do that I had 10 months prior to do before. But I just, for whatever reason, felt it was great to, to kick it down the road. So, you know, we've got deadlines, and we've got to prepare, and we've got to prepare. Well, John the Baptist was made to prepare the way for Christ. And you know, Jesus has come, he's come, he lived his life, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, we have the Holy Spirit, but we're still working towards something, aren't we? Is there something that we're preparing for down the road? I hope so, or else we're just kind of drifting in nothingness. So when I was looking over this, I found an article from, and I'm sure this person that wrote this never in a million years thought that their article would be used for a sermon, but I was Googling things like how to prepare for something effectively. And I found this article, this, this company's called Springborn Communications. They're like a, I don't know, public relations team or something like that. But it's Springboard Communications. The person that founded the company, her name was Susie Horgan, H-O-R-G-A-N. She wrote this article, The Seven Steps to Event Planning Success. So I need this in my life, right? I just to plan things and get things done. Now, we're going to kind of buzz through this, and then, we're, of course, we're going to take the, what the Bible says and look at John the Baptist and, you know, see examples in Scripture of how to effectively plan for. And then we also have to figure out, okay, what are we planning for? Maybe the Browns game? Maybe you're making a giant thing of nachos? I don't know, but this is preparation here. Now, this is according to her. Step one is define your objective. Anybody know what an objective is? It's what are we doing, Right? So it's in financial planning, we call it, what do you want to do? Because I have a lot of people that come in that are nearing retirement, and I'll sit down with them and say, okay, what do you want to do when you're retired? And they look at me like a deer in headlight. I have no clue. Well, what are we working towards? You know, it's, do you want to just work till you keel over? Do you want to have a fishing cabin? Do you want to travel? And Stephen Covey famously said, he's an author about productivity, begin with the end in mind. So what's the objective? So in this case, like, okay, we're planning an event. So our objective is to plan this event. That's step one, what are we doing? Step two, choose the location. Okay, so you could say, well, I want to have a, uh, a fishing party. Well, you've got to find a lake somewhere where you can have it. So you have to choose your location and make sure the location that you choose fits your state of, stated objective. Step number three, you've got to set a date. Because, you know, a, 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 something is a wish or a want to, unless there's a date attached to it, then it becomes a goal. Or someone like myself, if my teacher at the beginning of the year in high school or college would have said, all right, John, you're going to have a 30-page research paper due sometime, when would I start that paper? Probably wouldn't, right? It's like, I need to know where that deadline's at, then I'll get going on it. So you have to set a date. It's not a goal or, an, or anything until there's a date attached to it, or else it's just kind of a, a wishful thinking type of thing. And make sure if you set a date for, like, say, a party or something like that, you're having all the family over, make it at a time where they can show up. So you've got to kind of know, okay, who's my target audience? Who do I want to come to this? If you have a family member where a certain month out of the year you know that they're gone or they've got, like, sports tournaments the whole month, well, don't set the party for that date. So you got to kind of know your audience, too, a little bit and know who you're trying to attract and make it at a time where they can actually show up. Now, here's, here's the really hard part for me. Step four, she says, create a plan. And in this case, it is like a sequence of events, like a timeline. Okay, by, okay if, the, if the date is three months out, by the end of the first month, I should have this much done. And by the end of the second month, I should have this much done. And then that way, into the third month leading up to the event, things are running smoothly. There's no last-minute freakouts or anything like that where stuff just doesn't happen. 
So create a plan and make a timeline for it step by step. Now, of course, if you're inviting people to an event, you have to actually invite them, right? So again, you can't just mention it to them in passing, well, hey, in a couple of months, I'll probably do something and never send an invite. So you have to actually send an invitation out to the people that you're planning to have this party around or something like that. And there's a skill to this too, and and she goes into this a little bit more, but if you have a party that's six months from now, say you're getting married, and okay, you get the save the date thing. Well, there's a reason you send out a save the date card, and then you get a formal invitation after that. Because if you send me something six months prior, you think I'm going to remember that? No, so you can't send it too early, or nobody's going to remember what you're talking about. And if you send it too late, well, they might already have plans. So there's an art of notifying people of something, reminding them, and, and you know, giving them ample time to maybe they need to make some changes to their schedule if they really want to go to this event, or like a wedding, or uh, something like that, or a giant birthday party, or whatever you're trying to do. So if you do it too early, people are going to forget. If you do it too late, they might be booked. So there's not enough time. And it's important that you include all the necessary details in the, inv- in the invitation. You can't just say, hey, party at my place on this date. Well, it has to have a time. It has to be maybe the address, because maybe not everybody knows where you live. What can they bring? Or are they supposed to bring anything? How many people can come? You've got to be specific in your invitation. And then point number six, on the actual day of the event, maybe you should show up early and be prepared. You know, you don't want to roll in 10 minutes after the event starts that you're in, in control of. That doesn't look too good. Don't be late. And then step seven, according to her, is evaluate the event and ask yourself what could have gone better. So this is kind of a, and you can translate this to anything where there has to be a preparation involved. I think these are pretty good points, and I, I intend to use some more of these things in everyday life. So evaluation is key. Uh, in, in work, sometimes we call it like a, a pre-flight list before the appointment actually happens, and then there's a wrap-up or a get-together where you say, well, what went well, what went bad? Did we uncover what the person actually needed? You know, there's all these things that go into it, but if you don't sit back and evaluate what you did, then you're not going to learn as much as you should have learned for that particular event. So you actually have to have kind of a wrap-up or a get-together. So when I looked at all this, I said, okay, and this really did translate well to John the Baptist and what he had to do. So let's go to Luke chapter 3 again, the scripture that was read. We're going to look at verses 4 through 6. So Luke 3, 4 through 6, if you still have your Bibles there, it's great. If you've never seen me speak before, I use a lot of scripture, so if you got your Bible, keep it open. Or if you got your phone, don't let the screen lock out. We're going to be moving a little bit here, okay? So first we're going to start at Luke chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. And since it was just read to you, I'll I'll go ahead and read it here. It says, He went into all the regions around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance as for the forgiveness of sins. That's verse 3. Verse 4, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now I'm reading out of the ESV version, so you may have one that sounds a little bit different. But it's amazing how the Bible, being a collection of individual letters written over thousands of years, you know, we see that Jesus is going to fulfill all these things that Isaiah prophesied about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's it's really amazing. So this is Luke, you know, the author of this book talking about how John the Baptist had a specific job to do and he was prophesied about in the past because he was making the way of the Lord straight or making the way he's prophesying that Jesus will make the crooked way straight and kind of level out all the roughness that's here and I really like and I really appreciate verse 6 and unless you're Jewish you should as well that all flesh is going to see the glory of God we are all going to have a chance to be saved because of Jesus. So let's get into this text here. And if we can kind of compare it to this, this list that this, this author put together that she had that as a professional event planner, let's look at what John was doing here. 
But what was he hoping to achieve? And we already alluded to this. What was John the Baptist proclaiming? What was his goal for what he was trying to do is to proclaim who? The Messiah, right. The reason for us to be able to spend eternity with God in heaven. His objective was to proclaim, here he comes. And it's amazing. If you remember when Mary learned that she was pregnant with Jesus, she went and visited John the Baptist's mother, and what did the baby do? He was jumping for joy. You know, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit for this particular task before he was born, when he was just a little bitty baby. He knew what was going to happen, so he was laser-focused on what his task was. Now, so obviously his objective, proclaim that the Savior is coming, that we don't need to worry, it's going to be okay. And he did that with a lot of zeal. He was something. Now, when you look at this list again, step two, you know, pick a location. Well, we can look at location as far as the people group that Jesus initially was going to. Who did Jesus initially go to? The Jews. And that's, all, that's the only place he spent his ministry, preaching around that area. Now, he did talk to non-Jews, you know, to Gentiles. That, don't mistake me. But he initially, and Scripture says this, he first came to God's chosen people which were the Jewish people. Jesus descended from that line of people, and God picked them for a specific reason. So the location and the time, the location was his chosen people to the Israelites. And remember, God doesn't slack off on his promises. And that should make us feel good, because when God gives you a promise, you can take it to the bank, unless the bank collapses. But you know what I mean. You get the point, right? That when God says something, it's good. We don't even have to worry about it. And God even prophesied about this, or he told us about this in his scriptures back in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 12. It's the first book of the Bible. It's the easiest one to find, unless you get caught up in the table of contents or something. But let's look at Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to go verses 1 through 3. So Genesis 12, 1 through 3, we're going to meet a guy named Abram. His name was changed later to Abraham. But this is where God tells us what he's going to do and the location and the people group he's going to start with. And this is Genesis chapter 12. We're going to look at 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Verse 2, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How long ago was this? Abram turned into Abraham, which down the line became the children of Israel. So this particular person was given this promise after what? After God destroyed the entire world except for a family with a flood. This is after God wiped the slate clean, started with just one family. That one family grew and multiplied as they were commanded over the years, made a great nation, and instead of spreading out and inhabiting all the earth the way God told them to, they decided to build a tower. Anybody know what that tower is called? Babel. And I I may have said this before, but anybody wonder why all over the world there are these massive, massive stone structures that are amazingly engineered that seem like the people all knew what they were doing. You guys ever wonder that? Why there's pyramids here, pyramids there, monoliths here, pyramids. Every continent of the world, there's these massive stone-cut, elaborate pyramids and structures that we can't even do today because the people got together, were really brilliant, after the flood, were great with stonework, making towers like the Tower of Babel, and they disobeyed God. So what did God do? Split them up all over the, all over the world. The Bible's always right, okay? So any young people out here, if you're watching like ancient aliens, it's all talked about in Genesis. This is nothing new to Christians. So yes, there were giant, brilliant people back in the day that were really great at building pyramids, and God put them all over the world. So no, it was not little green men coming down from a spaceship. This was all told about thousands of years ago, and it should be no surprise to us that we see giants and pyramids and stone structures all over the world. Because the people so smart and so focused, 
we're building a massive, massive tower out of stone. So, cool little side note there. The Bible's always right. So, it wasn't little green men, it was the Tower of Babel, and God broke the whole thing up. And out of the mess that, he just destroyed the whole world, and if you read what happened to Noah right after the ark, it wasn't that great. And then, of course, the people got disobedient again, were building a massive stone structure, God broke them up, and he found one guy, and he said, all right, you. And when we look all the way back in Genesis, does he say that just your race of people, quote unquote, are going to be blessed? What does Genesis chapter 12 say? At the end of verse 3, in all the families of the earth, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families. Not just one particular line of people, but out of this line of Abram, who became Abraham, is where Jesus was born out of. So again, right after the flood in the Tower of Babel, God told us exactly what he was going to do, and he did it. No surprise, right? Again, to those of us that understand who's in control, when God says something, it's good. So he came to his chosen people at the chosen time, which is, leads into my next point. If you remember the kind of the seven steps I went through, step one, what are we looking to do? Step two, pick a location. But step three, you've got to pick a date. Anybody wonder why you live now when you live like, yeah, I always wonder, like, why wasn't I in the Old Testament? Why wasn't I around when Jesus was around? Why did Jesus show up when he did? Well, let's look at that. So let's set a date. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. And if you've got your Bibles here, Galatians 4, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. So Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia. He said, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. He's referring to us being children of God. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But, and this is verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. What the Apostle Paul is telling us here, and which we understand as believers, is that Jesus showed up when he did at the exact right time. God has all of this planned out, and he knew at this time, in this year, in this region, I'm coming down to earth, and I'm going to do what I came to do, and what I knew I had to do from since before the earth was even formed. So at the exact right moment, Christ was born. And I I love the way God did what he did. And we don't, we will never totally understand everything about God because we're the created, we're created. The creation can never look at its creator and say, hey, I get it. Or I understand why you did that. Because, you know, he is our father. He's God. And he chose his plan of redemption and he chose to bring Jesus to earth. He came down as a man when he decided to, because that was the perfect right time to do so. And so when we're looking at ourselves, we can say, well, okay, I still don't get it, John, but now I want you to stop and think about what I just said, though. Jesus came down at the exact right time. God knew who you were from the beginning of the world, so are you here by accident? No. We are not the Messiah. We will never be like Jesus, okay? We are sinful, created people, okay? But because God knew you from before the time the earth was created, he knew when Jesus was going to come down. We are here at this side of the cross at this exact time for a reason. So don't believe any lie out there that says you're just a cosmic accident. 
Don't believe any lies that say that we're just atoms fizzing together that came out of stardust that exploded from who knows when. You were put here at this time for an exact reason, and you've got a job to do. It wasn't to build bigger barns. It wasn't to get, you know, just be selfish. It wasn't to hurt people. It wasn't just to do what you feel like whenever you feel like. We're, we're put here to serve. And the Bible's very clear about that. And when we look at one of our, our favorite Bible stories that we talk about, and I know Paula loves it a lot too, is, the, is Esther. And Esther had a job to do, didn't she? She had a job to do. And I, one of my favorite parts of the book of Esther is what her uncle tells her. So if any of my nieces or nephews are, are watching this, listen to your uncle John. No, I'm just kidding. But her uncle Mordecai that you know, was raising her and took over for her when his brother passed away, he sent for her and he said, Hey, Esther, you as a Jewish woman are inside the king's court. Like You're, you're in there. Now, even back then, the king, if you went to the king's chamber unannounced or uninvited, he could kill you. If he didn't want to see your face, you know, off with her head. So Esther, even though she was chosen by the king to be one of his, she still, it was a scary proposition to just go to the king and ask her a favor. Now, a little backstory, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's an evil person in the kingdom at that time that wanted to kill all the people that were Jewish. Just wanted to wipe them all out. And they tricked the king into signing a decree that couldn't be broken to allow the Jewish people to be systematically wiped out. Well, Esther's uncle heard about this. And all the people, all the Israelites were in sackcloth and ashes. They were, it was, they were a mess. Well, what, understandably so. But Mordecai went to his, his niece and said, Esther, you got to do something about this. And she basically, I'm paraphrasing, said, well, what can I do? Or are you sure? And he said, look, and I love his perspective on this. He said, God is going to do his will no matter what. Okay? But maybe, just maybe, you were put here at this exact moment for this reason. So Mordecai, number one, had faith that God was going to do what he was going to do. And as Christians, sometimes we, we wring our hands and fret about things that are going on around us, but God's still in control. He's still sovereign. And if you say, well, why does he allow bad things to happen to people? Well, read the Bible, okay? There's a lot of things that we don't understand. And we see that God, you know, put us on here, gave us free will. But at the same time, you know, why were the children of Israel enslaved at that time? Why were, I can't answer all those questions, again, because I'm not the creator. But what I do know is that his will is going to be done. And we were chosen to put, be put here at this time to be a part of that. Now, we can try to shirk our responsibility, but God's, you know, the Bible says God is, you can't mock him. He never misses his promises. What, what he promises is going to happen is going to happen. But he maybe, and I want you to just to understand this, he made you the way you are with all of your problems, with all of the things that you don't like about yourself, with all, of the, all the baggage that we carry as people to show his glory. Does God use people that, quote unquote, have it all together? No, he doesn't. If you read the Bible, who does he pick? People that are dependent on him. Right? Now, back in Esther, in the she was pretty. That's why the king chose her. But she was a Jewish woman, and she was a person just like anybody else that was afraid. But she trusted that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And her uncle did, too. And she, if you read the book of Esther, it's a great read. She carried out God's plan that he had for her, which is why he put her there. So you may not be a princess in the harem of a king, but maybe you're in a job that you can't stand because maybe there's somebody in there that needs to see Jesus through you. Maybe there's a, a customer at the other end of the phone that needs to know that they're talking to someone that cares about their, their salvation. Maybe there is, you know, we could go on and on and on. Maybe your children or your parents need to see something in you through the, what you're going through. I don't know. And I'm not going to look at you and tell you this is what you need to do and why, because I'm not God. But where you're at right now, God made you for this purpose. Good, bad, or indifferent. Right? And if, we, if Scripture is any guide, which it always is, we're going to understand why at some point. We're going to get to there. So, set a date. 
Well, I just kind of gave you the answer. If you're here right now, this is your time. This is the date that you were set apart for. Step four for this list on how to get something done, create a plan. What is our timeline? Well, I already told you that one too. It's right now. And we look at things like the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, and I'm going to read this here to you. But it's in Matthew 28, after Jesus rose from the dead from being on the cross, before he ascended to heaven to be at the right hand of God, he gave his disciples the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 16 through 19, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and get this, but some doubted. Again, that's what the ESV version talks about. Even then, after seeing Jesus raised from the dead, some people doubted. I'm, I'm going to touch on that a little bit later here. And Jesus said to them, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make the disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So that was given how many years ago? 2,000 years ago, roughly? A little less than that right now? So set a date, create a plan. What's our timeline? Our timeline is now. This is not a can we want to kick down the road. I, I Sometimes and I, you get this imagery of Judgment Day. I don't know if you ever think about this like I do. But could you imagine, and I, I felt this way when people I know of that have passed away, that I don't, and again, I'm not God, I can't judge them, but I don't, I don't believe they're saved. You look at it and you're like, man, did I miss something? Like, of course, God is sovereign, but did I miss an opportunity to witness? We don't want to be in that position. Like what I read earlier from that lady that had the plan on how to create something about invitations, don't send it too late. We don't want to feel that way. That, you know, man, we, we, we missed it. And it's, I don't believe this is anywhere in the Bible. I do know people are going to appeal to God this way, but imagine if there's this giant line on Judgment Day and the person in front of you turns around and says, why didn't you tell me? I sat next to you in the cubicle for 35 years at the same company and you never mentioned this to me. I, I was listening to a sermon, and if you hadn't heard me say this before, and I'm guilty of this as well, I'm not passing judgment on anybody, but we're afraid to witness a lot of times because we don't want to hurt people's feelings or make them not like us. What we're doing is, if you really get down to the brass tacks of it, is we're selfish because we care more about them being our friend than telling them the truth. If you have a child and you see them walking towards a pit, are you going to grab them and say, don't fall in there? Or are you afraid that maybe I'll upset them if I tell them don't fall into the pit and we just watch them collapse? You're not going to do that. How much more serious is it to know that the person next to you that you love is, could spend eternity in hell apart from God because we were too scared to mention something to them? There's many theological things, directions we can go down with that statement, but let's live, live as if that's the truth. That the person next to you that you care about is going to spend eternity separate from Christ unless they hear. Because we, we preach this a lot in the CMA, and it's, ta- it's in Romans chapter 10 that we got to issue the invitation. We got to send it out. Then, you know, that's step five of having a good party. When? Now. The timeline now. Issue the invitation. So, step five would be issue the invitation from God. You know, Romans chapter 10 how beautiful the feet of those that bring the good news, because if, unless somebody hears, how can they believe? Again, what did I say earlier that Mordecai said to his niece? You were put here at this exact time right now. Don't let somebody miss the party, okay? And I use party, maybe that's the wrong word because it's so much more serious than that. But if we're not here to be a light, what are we doing? And just imagine, put that in your head on judgment day, your buddy at the cubicle next to you turns to you and says, why didn't you say anything? How selfish are we to carry this treasure and not share it? You know, we don't want to be like that, and I'm going to use a trick-or-treating analogy, please forgive me. But you see the candy bowl on the porch with a sign that says take one? Are you going to take that whole thing and dump it in your own bag and and hoard that? Or are you going to spread it around? Are you going to let other people know that, hey, you don't have to live in sin. 
You don't have to live with this crushing guilt. And more importantly, you don't have to spend eternity apart from our Creator. So, share it. Pass it out. Send out the invitation. Now, we do know that not everybody's going to accept it. And I'm going to go to Romans chapter 10 here. Because I don't want you to get discouraged. Romans chapter 10. Let's look at 18 through 21. I'm going to back up and read the verse before that in 17. So faith, just kind of set the stage. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. God's word. And a lot of times we get, I I sometimes I make the mistake of watching people. And I, I kind of do this to keep myself understanding the questions that are there. But I get caught up in watching people object to Christianity and list all the reasons why they think it's ridiculous. And the Bible talks about that very plainly. It says to the Jews it was a stumbling block, meaning that their power, their theocracy was challenged. And to the Greeks it was just foolishness, meaning like, oh, you silly Christians. How can you believe in all that stuff? The Bible's very transparent that most people are going to feel that way about you. And sometimes I watch people and I get so angry. I'm like, and and it's in my mind, I'm like, if I could just talk to that person. But we got to back up here a little bit. Yes, we do need to spread the word, we need to share the gospel, but how are we sharing it? Are we going in argumentatively, or are we simply giving the invitation of Jesus Christ? What the apostles knew to do, what Paul resigned himself rightfully so to do. So faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's verse 17. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses said, now Moses was, Abraham was probably number one, Moses was number two to the Israelites. Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. What's he alluding to? A salvation's coming to the Gentiles. So the children of Israel, hey, you're going to be jealous at some point. Moses said that. Verse 20, then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Isaiah said that. Again, that's us. Now verse 21, this is what's scary. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Well, since Jesus came and died and fulfilled the law, he didn't end it, he completed the law of Moses to where the sacrificial system isn't necessary anymore because the perfect sacrifice has already been made. But what he's telling us is even the people that thousands of years ago, God himself appeared to Abram and said, I'm going to make of you a great nation if you just stick with me. And it was never enough, right? Right? Just read the Bible. We know how many times the children of Israel left communion directly with God the Father because they wanted a person to be a king. They wanted to follow an idol as soon as things got inconvenient. So back to this, we see what happened with the children of Israel who were God's chosen people. And then when I mentioned uh, before Jesus ascended to heaven after the Great Commission, there's that little comma in that one verse that said, but some still didn't believe. So brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be stressed out, and and I get so angry too, I'm not going to convince somebody to be saved. Are we commanded to do that? How are we commanded to handle and deliver the invitation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? With humility, with gentleness, and the Apostle Paul, who was a brilliant man and a driven man, who probably would have been a good salesman said, I've learned that I'm just going to present the gospel because everything else is just foolishness. Preach Jesus and him crucified. That's it. That's all our job is to do. You know, our God knows us, and he knows the human heart. He knows he made us. So he says, look, I've got all the power. All I'm asking you to do is proclaim my name. So yes, people may make fun of you. They may say, prove it, you weirdo. They may say, well, why doesn't God come down and smack me in the head right now? There's so many things that you hear about. But all of our job is to do is present Christ and Him crucified. 
I remember seeing a, a, a pastor speak who, you know, wildly successful church, and I, I've mentioned this before, but he has PhDs and built this big church through the grace of the Holy Spirit, and this was his whole point. He laid out this great theological argument for Jesus, and the person said, nah, I'm good. But one of the students, one of the youth group kids, sat down and was using salt and pepper shakers and making an analogy, and the other person was like, yeah, I need that. It defies our understanding. But that's grace, isn't it? That's the Holy Spirit. That's the power of what we're carrying and we're preparing the way. You know, John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. But this invitation, this thing that we're sending out, what are we preparing the, day, for the way for? It's for Judgment Day. And the beauty of the gospel is it's simple. All the power is in the name of Jesus Christ. God has spoken. He's given us his written word. Our job is to just to deliver this treasure, and it's so simple. So I want you to be encouraged that you, and don't get discouraged if someone says, no, nah, I don't buy it. I mean, it happened to all the apostles. It happened to Jesus. Jesus rises from the dead, gives the Great Commission, and there's people standing there that still don't really believe it happened. So don't get discouraged. Your job, and if you love somebody, is to deliver the truth, but you've got to leave it up to God from there. But don't shy away from the truth. Don't think, well, maybe it's not right, or maybe I delivered it wrong, or don't beat yourself up. Just proclaim Jesus and him crucified and trust the Holy Spirit to, to bring the increase. Now, verse six, not verse six, number six of the thing that I mentioned earlier, remember I said on the day of the event, show up on time or early, get stuff ready? Well, in the Bible, we, we're not gonna know when the exact date of Judgment Day is gonna be. People get into a lot of trouble trying to predict the exact day that Jesus is coming back. And remember, Jesus said, basically says, I'm not going to tell you. That's for the Father to know. Now, we know that Jesus was God, and he knows. But, you know, as, you know, when he was down here as a man, he basically is telling us, look, that day and that hour that God blows the whistle on everything, that's for him to know and us to find out. But there's another twist to this. The thing about life is that nobody gets out alive. Okay? So, and the Bible says too that sometimes we may seek to preserve our lives, but we're going to lose it eternally. Now, we don't live in a country right now where we're persecuted by threat of death. Like, I can stand up here and preach right now. I don't know how much longer that's going to last. That's in God's hands. And again, we can't wring our hands worrying about who does this and who does that. We've got to leave that to God. But at the end of the day, there are countries right now out there where if you're preaching the word, they'll kill you. Over in the Middle East, you know, we have creative access, international workers, because if their name shows up on Facebook and, and the people over there know that they're actively trying to convert people out of Islam into Christ, they'll kill them. I mean, it happened to all the apostles, right? So if you try to preserve your life by being ashamed of the gospel, you're going to lose it. Because if you're saved and you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're not going to be ashamed of the gospel. You know, we could be like the Apostle Peter before he received the Holy Spirit and be ashamed. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, this isn't it. This world is not it. This is just, you know, our life is like a vapor. We're here today, gone tomorrow. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And if you're saved... You're going to be with God forever. So the day and the time, we don't know. Live as if it's right now, okay? Because we all drive cars. This body we saw with the pandemic, how many hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, it might be a million before it's all said and done in this country alone. Life is fragile. We're in the hands of a forgiving God if you're saved. If you're not saved, I'm, I'm begging you today. I'm telling you the truth in love. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Okay? We're not following an Oprah theology where there's many routes to heaven. There's only one, and it's Jesus Christ. He died for you, specifically. Okay? Your name was on his heart when he was hanging on the cross. So today's the day. Today's the day of the event. Don't let the door get shut on you. Now, the last step in this, you know, the, the worldly way to plan an event was to evaluate. 
Thankfully, brothers and sisters, the judging and the evaluation is done by our Heavenly Father, who is perfect. Now, you can't dwell with a Heavenly Father who's perfect in this sinful state, can you? So the gospel of Jesus Christ is this, if you've never heard it before, is that God created the heavens of the earth. It was not a cosmic accident. Your grandparent wasn't a rock that had water pouring on it and made molecules, okay? We, we can, it's just scientifically ridiculous. We serve a God of miracles who exists outside of space, time, and matter, and he loves you, and he had you in mind before he did all of this. You can see his handiwork in everything. This is clearly designed. He made the heavens and the earth with you in mind. He set everything in motion. He created people. He created things. He created you know, everything that you see, he made. And that man, in our own hearts, we're stubborn and rebellious, and we sin. We have free will. We sinned. We fell from grace. We need a Savior. It goes right back to Genesis. That the reason that Jesus had to come at all is that Adam and Eve fell. Okay? So, living as you are, we would like to think that everybody's good, but what does the Bible tell us? Everybody's sinful. Me, you, everybody. We can't judge anyone. We are all just as sinful in the eyes of a perfect God. Throughout the early time, you know, he had his children of Israel. They had a sacrificial system foreshadowing the Savior. But what people had to learn was that animals, the blood of bulls and goats and animals, sacrificed, it doesn't do anything. There's no power there. To live with a perfect God, he had to send his perfect son. Now think about this real quick. And, and a lot of times people say, well, I, John, I don't like God because bad things happen. What happened to his own son? The beauty of our Savior, if you've never really realized this, there's nothing that you will go through that he has not gone through and then some. If you have a parent or a boss that tells you what to do but then doesn't do it, do you respect them very much? Well, people that don't understand God and, and salvation believe that God is this cosmic old guy sitting up in the sky judging you. When in reality, he humbled himself, came down in the form of a man in Jesus Christ, lived a poor life, despised by people, despised by everybody in his hometown. He was made fun of as being born out of wedlock, like he was an illegitimate child. He was called that. Okay? Then his own followers turned their back on him. He was arrested for not doing anything wrong, but out of love for you, he allowed this to happen. Why? Because he knew it was his plan to die on the cross for you. His one single sacrifice covers all sin. From now to before, through all through eternity, Jesus completely fulfilled the law and made a way that you can be with a perfect heavenly father forever. He came down as a man. He died. Three days later, he rose from the dead, conquered death. And that is why you can be in heaven forever. There is no other way. You're not going to walk enough steps to get there. You're not going to buy enough indulgences to get there. You, brothers and sisters, aren't going to pray anybody else into heaven. Okay? Jesus is a personal Savior. He is not out of reach for anybody. And it's amazing to see the people that he used. The Apostle Paul that I've been talking about murdered Christians. Okay? Through him, God wrote most of the books of the New Testament. You think you're out of reach for salvation? No, there is no way you can escape the love of God. And he, he showed us that on the cross by willingly dying for us who despised him. Now, let's look at kind of the end game here. You kind of, the saying is, you know, I, I read the, the back of the book and we win. Let's go to Revelation 21. And then we'll wrap up. So if you have your Bible, turn to Revelation 21. We're going to read verses 5 through 7. So we were in Genesis, now we're going to the end. It's the last book of the Bible. If you're in the maps, you've got to go a little bit back farther. So Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. Again, what's the objective? This is where we're going. And we want to do our job as followers of Christ to spread his name out there as much as possible so as many people as God you know, saves can be there with us. So Revelation 21, 5 through 7. 
And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Remember what we said earlier about when God tells you something, it's going to happen? I got a whole other sermon about stuff that you can see happening that's, that's in the Bible, okay? The Bible's always right. It predicts things. We've seen it in the past, and we will see it in the future. He said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And the alphabet at the time, that's like the letter A and the letter Z, the beginning and the end. He's everything. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's the promise. We get to spend eternity with God in heaven, and then the you know, Revelation goes on to describe, and this is the, you know, the Apostle John and the best words he can use that we can understand, trying to describe heaven and what it's like to be there with God. His promise is, I'm going to wipe away everybody's tears. You're not going to have pain and suffering anymore. You're not going to sin anymore. You're not going to need anything. You're not going to have to pay for you know, water. You don't need food. There's no night or day because we're just in the presence of God. There's no pain, no suffering. That's the event that we're planning for. Jesus paid the cost. The reason you're here, what you should be planning for, is to give out as many invitations as you can. And be there yourself. Be right with the Lord. If you've allowed the lies that people are going to tell you uh, that God isn't real, that Jesus isn't the only way, that you know, choosing a life of sin is just the way you are, that's not the case. What the truth is, is that the Bible tells us that we're sinful. It tells us that people are going to lie to us. It tells us that, frankly, most people aren't going to buy it. But it's not your job or my job to know who that is or judge or pass any preconceived notions on anybody just to maintain our level of comfort. Our job is to pass out those invitations as much as we can. And the invitation is what I just told you. God came down as Jesus, died on the cross for your sins, rose after three days, and by believing in him, you can have eternal life. Before Jesus went to heaven, he said, hey, go out, spread the gospel, baptize people in my name, and get to all the ends of the earth. That's our job. So if you found yourself maybe not handing out invitations because you're afraid, I want to pray for you today, and myself. Because believe me, I've had times where I could have shared the gospel, and out of fear, I just didn't, and that's embarrassing. But I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to judge you if you've done the same thing either, okay? But the point is, is that that was yesterday, today is now, and today is the day. So if somebody needs to hear the gospel, tell them the truth about Jesus Christ. If you've heard the gospel and you've, you, you feel, you know, you know you should be doing something different, but you're not because you're afraid, you're stubborn, you, maybe you're a rebel at heart where if someone tells you the sky is blue, you're going to tell them, no, it's orange. There's people like that. You may be one of those people. Don't let today pass by. I'm going to give an invitation here, and we're going to pray for people that aren't saved. Like I mentioned earlier, the people that celebrate Halloween because they think that it's fun or Satan's in control. He's not. He's a liar. And his day is coming, trust me, where he's, he's going to get punished. He already is. But the point is this. I'm going to give the invitation. We're going to pray for you. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you want to, we're here. Elders are here. Come down. We'll pray with you. If you say, John, I don't really know what you're talking about, but I feel like I need to know more about this Jesus guy, grab me. You know, if, if somebody is a Christian that you know, pull them aside, say, look, I got questions. It's okay to have questions. That's why God gave us the Bible. We're going to have questions. We're going to need to go and look at things and read it and understand and pray that, that God can explain things to us. I know there's one more song after the sermon. So during the song, we're all going to stand as a congregation after I pray here. And if you feel led by the Holy Spirit to accept that free gift to RSVP, to that invitation that was given to you about Christ, don't put it off. 
If you feel that you've accepted it, but maybe you just are ashamed of the gospel, or maybe you've allowed yourself to slip away because of the lies and the sins of the world. I, I watched Pastor Eric's sermon from last week again on YouTube, and he's talking about the parable of the soils. You know, if you're that thing that shot up right away, but the, the weeds or the cares or the lies of the world are choking you out, you can break free of that as well too. So today's the day of salvation and today's the day of repentance. We don't know if we're going to have tomorrow. So I'm going to go to God in prayer and then we'll, we'll stand for our final song. So please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we know that you are our creator. I mean, just your, the world is evidence of that. The design, the beauty, the fall leaves, it's all evidence of you. And just us being here and having an understanding of who we are and that we exist and that you put us here at this time, none of this was by accident. And Lord, if there's somebody today that's never accepted the gift of salvation, the invitation of faith in you and your son, just remove any barriers they might have today and make today the day. And Lord, maybe those that, are, that have accepted it but are afraid you know, like the father in the New Testament story about this, his son that was possessed. He said, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Help that person to turn to you today and know that you are still in control. And that when you promise something like salvation, like that it's, it's not our job to convince people of you, but it's our job just to spread the gospel, give us a new confidence and take away any fears we have of sharing your, your gospel. And Lord, for those today on Halloween that are deceived, about who's really in control, break through to them today. Take away any, any perceived power or any issues they may have. Take it away and show yourself to them in a way that only you can through the, through the Holy Spirit, Lord. Just ask for protection on anybody today that's out and about and help us to be a light in a dark world. And Lord, we have to trust you. Even if we don't understand why things are going the way they are, we have to trust that we were put here at this time for a specific reason and that you've got this. That nothing surprises you and that your will is going to be done. And Lord, we are thankful that you invite us to be a part of it. And Lord, if, just, if anybody is here today that needs prayed for, that wants to receive you today, today's the day, Father, and we're begging you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. you please stand with me for the final song?
right, praise the Lord, everyone. And know that you have salvation. It's a free gift of him through Jesus' death on the cross. And don't be, ashamed, don't, don't be ashamed. Pass it out this week. If you're passing out candy today, you know, it's okay to mention the gospel too. And uh, just know that he loves you and know that it's not your strength, it's his. And just be encouraged. And uh, just go in peace and uh, continue to pray for Eric and his family, for Pastor Eric. And um, just for anybody else that you know is suffering or hurting because we do serve a good God. And he's got something better planned for us. So, amen. Be safe.